अथे वासुदेवाया <coughs> so um tonight in continuation on the series lessons from lockdown um last week we talked about the need to actually have a guiding light in in our life in order for us to become healthier and happier and more more purposeful I was uh, I saw a newspaper um, report out of the UK and it mentioned that um 43% of people in the UK felt that they had gone through some personal improvement uh in themselves and their life during the lockdown period that it really caused them to reflect on things and I think two of the the main things that you saw coming out of it when you look at most of the feedback from around the world one is people were spending less money and there as a result of it were feeling less of a need to spend money and the other one that really stood out was people um reaching out to each other even if it was only online zooming or whatever and um having a having warmer uh personal c- connections of course it's not everybody but this was kind of quite um pronounced and so tonight where i want to take this is is how how do we make those kind of changes in our life more more permanent um i've mentioned that, you know the need for some sort of like transcendent guiding light to sort of help us um come to that sort of position and so what i wanted to talk about tonight though is is the idea of actually developing um some sort of code to live by if you look at their situation in the world i mean everywhere within smaller societies uh national groups um church organizations um civic organizations social groups uh corporations or companies or all, all of them sort of have some sort of framework that they follow they have a value system they have pretty much rules of what's going to be the conduct and where we're going how we're going to to proceed and these um guidelines or rules that societies or social groups use are actually quite essential for the healthy function of of societies but when you consider what's really happening um in many cases not necessarily all but in many cases people sort of know how they're meant to act when for instance uh, if if i'm at work i work for some big company and they have very specific for instance um ideas of social responsibility and you know their approach to dealing with issues related to the environment and and society you know as a on the, on the whole and so when i make decisions on behalf of the company when i act as a representative of the company when i engage with our customer base or other people i have to be very mindful of those things and and they guide how how i do stuff but i don't necessarily take those things on board as being really part of my life that's sort of something that i often adopt while i'm on the premises of my work or at some social organization or a religious organization or church or something but as soon as i step out of the control as it were or the influence then i tend to to behave differently 
So that principle is the difference between external control and internal control. There is a need for us to exercise control of our mind and desires, our passions. In the Bhagavad Gita, it speaks about people having a higher nature or a lower nature and how we should try to cultivate our life connected to this higher nature rather than becoming base and following this more animalistic or or lower nature. And that will have a lower um, impact in terms of of violence or distress or, you know, just our our footprint, our consumption of of things. Our footprint will become lighter and when I follow the higher nature, and it will be much heavier if I follow that, that lower nature. When we think about it objectively and we discuss these things, I mean, everybody recognizes, okay, yeah, I, there is a need for me to adopt a, a better way of living. The big jump for people will happen when instead of just feeling like in certain environments I'm being controlled by outside forces or rules or restrictions, that I actually adopt a code of conduct, a value system. I really actually think about it and I work on it quite somewhat regularly. I, I revisit it and I consider decisions that I made, the nature of my relationships, how I reacted to things, um, you know, pretty much my whole life. I hold it up against this these set of values and priorities that I have. And I look for areas that really need improvement. And I do seek that improvement because it's actually going to end up with me living living a better quality of life where I really experience more peace, I can actually experience more happiness, not just a freedom from anxiety and stress, but we're talking about actual deep peacefulness and, and real spiritual happiness. So the development of some sort of code that I'm sort of voluntarily agreeing to live by. And it's coming from me. It's coming from somewhere inside rather than an external imposition. It's something that I want to do because I'm making the intelligent decision to live a better life and to experience better outcomes because of that. So then the question is, you know, so who who do we turn to? Where do do we turn to, to find, um, you know, guiding principles that we could perhaps consider, you know, should I adopt this? Should I accept this? Should I utilize this in my life? And it's always a little bit interesting to look at some sort of like well-known examples. And of course, there's a myriad of examples, but I'll I'll just look at a, a couple of things I just pulled up really quickly here. Um, you know, uh, the Rotary Club is really famous for what they call their four-way test, meaning you test your decisions, you test your actions, your relationships, you test everything in your life um, with, with this this four-way test. So um, the four things that they ask themselves, is it the truth? If I'm going to say something, if I'm going to act on something, I'm going to be connected with someone, is, am, I, am I living in truth? Is it the truth? Am I being honest? Am I being deceitful? Is it fair to all concerned? The decisions that I make, uh, my dealings with individuals, the actions that I take, is, is it fair to all concerned? Then the third one, will it build goodwill and better friendships? 
And the fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? So, I mean, if we just utilize those four principles, then, you know, I, every time we, we did something major and then over time, even the, the less significant things in our life, and we use that as the yardstick, we would be a better person. Our relationships and how we deal with others would be better. There would be a tremendous, um, a tremendously positive effect on our lives just just from those. Um, pushing on a little bit further, um, Lions Club, another civic organization. And when you look at their their mission and vision, their mission is to empower volunteers to serve their communities to meet humanitarian needs, to encourage peace, and to promote international understanding through the Lions Clubs. And the vision is to be a global leader in community and humanitarian service. This is pretty lofty ideals. And if, you know, we could find elements within these things that we could apply in our life. So I took a look at Boy Scouts of New Zealand, and they have a, a Scouts promise. And it is, on my honor, I promise to do my best, to develop my spiritual beliefs, to contribute to my community, to the country, and to the world, to help other people, and to live by the scout law. So uh, their, their values that they try to inculcate with their, you know, all the young scouts and to, to adopt, it, it, it's three categories. One is to have respect, to have respect for yourself and others. And the second part of that is to have respect for the environment. Then the second category is to do what is right. And so they divide that to being trustworthy and tolerant. And the second part of that is to have integrity. Then the third item is to be positive to accept challenges with courage, and to be a friend to all. So, I mean, these things are, are, are really noble. And if we could dig a little deeper within and actually become resolved after seeing, you know, what we've been through and where things are going, and learning to kind of slow down a little bit and to consider, to be able to consider these points. But there's a lot of room for improvement in my life. This idea of having these, these values or virtues, as they were also referred to, um, if you look back as far as, as the Greek, um, during the time of, of the heyday of the Greeks, and their, their empire, and then the Roman Empire, they, they pretty much shared four what they classified as cardinal virtues. And they listed them as temperance. I mean, everything in moderation. Temperance, prudence, courage, and justice. So um, we're kind of running through these things a little bit quickly. And the only reason we're doing it that way is just trying to remind everybody that this is um, for thousands of years, people have sought to live individually and collectively by these guiding virtues. Within Christianity, they had um, seven virtues, just like they had seven um, deadly sins or seven vices. So there was also seven virtues. And they listed them as humility, 
kindness, temperance, chastity, patience, charity, and diligence. I mean, these, you know, a lot of people have got this kind of, you know, religion sort of like gone out of fashion with a lot of people for some reason or other. Um, uh, but the problem is when we don't like some particular thing or some person that we felt was a bit on the fanatical side or, you know, we've tended to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic um, idiom because, you know, that which is unwanted, the dirty bathwater needs to go. But the baby should not be thrown out. And even within, you know, almost all religions in the world, you know, um, Islam, uh, Judaism, um, Taoism, uh, Confucius, Confucius and Buddha. I mean, you, you look at all the different religious traditions and they all had these, these shared values. And that's because these principles are really time-tested and they, I would refer to them as eternal and universal principles that guide us in how to become better as a person and how to live socially and, and in relation to the world in which we live, how to live more responsibly and caringly. The adoption of these types of things make a huge difference. The problem becomes when people, as I said earlier, they tend to embrace these things within, you know, they're in within the four walls of figurative or literal of some institution or organization. But then as soon as they step out, they tend to completely, you know, or largely abandon these. And a, a big part of that is due to the utterly materialistic values that have been pushed and promoted, particularly over the last century. I feel that, that society as a whole has been terribly um, undermined by the development of this idea of self-importance, the rise of the self over all others, and the self as an intense consumer of things, having this idea that the more active I can be, the more stuff I can consume, which of course all means the more money I have to spend, then somehow I will become happier. My life will be better. Whereas the truth is just the opposite, just the opposite of this is true. To be more concerned about others than oneself. And I say that in, in a liberal and a thoughtful way, not, not, you know, some people are going, oh, what, I shouldn't take care of myself. No, nobody's saying that. You know, we need to take care of ourselves most definitely. But when I put myself as being at the pinnacle of consideration, it's all about me. And then whatever I consider to be in my interest. And the problem there is a lot of the ideas that I've developed as to what's in my interest are not actually even coming from me. They've been planted there within the, you know, the framework of the society and this consumer economic system that we, that we have, that we're living in. So, um, there is a need to get back to some basics and to consider what are some of the things that I could live by. In the Ashtanga yoga process, the mystical yoga process, um, they, they observed 
what were called uh, yama and niyama, the eightfold path of yoga. Um, these were the, the the two foundational building blocks upon which a whole yoga lifestyle and practice was developed. Um, the term uh, yama refers to um, the control of the senses, where I don't just become enslaved by desire and my, and my senses demanding things, but I, I am the one in, in control of, of my life. And niyama were observances, um, the observance of specific sort of rules. And Patanjali laid out in the Yoga Sutra what these were. He defined the yamas as being non-violence, truthfulness, not stealing or coveting things, celibacy, and freedom from possessiveness. These are huge principles, and we're not going to be able to get into to everything here to, tonight, but we will deal with them over the next couple of weeks. And then he says, these laws are universal and must be practiced without consideration of time, place, birth, or circumstances. Together, they constitute the great vow of life. And so, you know, in, in, since ancient times, people actually co contemplated and considered these things. And their codes that they were going to live by, they actually really internalized that. And they took a vow to actually really, really follow these things very diligently. The niyamas or observances have been laid out by Patanjali. He says they are internal and external purity, contentment, the acceptance of austerity, the recitation of sacred mantras, and the study of Vedic texts, and complete devotion and surrender to the Supreme Soul or Ishwara. So these were um, what he um, laid out as being not just advised, but actually an absolute requirement if one is going to seek spiritual enlightenment, liberation, um, through the Ashtanga Yoga process. Things were a little bit different, not entirely, in, in relation to the bigger picture of the Vedic culture, which was, was broader in practices and and the practices of the different paths of yoga aside from from ashtanga yoga i don't know if you recall or if you heard it was a few months back i i did a talk on um it was called the words of a dying man and we spoke about a great warrior and hero um, his name was Bhishma Deva, and he was uh, quite elderly. Um, he died on this, in this battlefield. He was a great warrior, and he was a, a prince in the kingly class. He was an exemplary person, and many of his own um, grandsons were involved on both sides in this great, great battle. And we talked about how he was, you know, shot full of arrows. And when he fell, that not one part of his body was touching the ground. He had arrows going through all over his body. And yet even in that condition, after the battle was completed, he retained the life within his body through yogic control and practice. And he spoke to his grandson who came to visit him along with other grandsons. And his grandson, Yudhishthira, had refused to accept the throne, um, seeing how many people had died in that battle. 
and he spoke to Yudhishthira um, for an extended period of time, even in that frightful condition. Uh, and asked him to really reconsider and that he should accept the great austerity of becoming a true leader and being responsible for those in his care. And in the lengthy discourse that he gave, he spoke about what he considered um, nine qualifications. And he said that one cannot be called a civilized person without acquiring these preliminary qualities. So this is not even the final thing. These are the preliminary qualities. And the first is the one that really stuns a lot of people. It states there not to become angry that one needs to really actively cultivate this quality. Second was not to lie. The third was to equally distribute wealth. That means to one's family and others in their community, and especially those in, in need. The fourth was to forgive to really practice, to learn and practice forgiveness. The fifth was to not beget children with anyone other than one's legitimate wife. Um, and of course, that, that principle, and maybe we'll talk about that next week, you know, deals a lot with really learning to curb the tendencies to objectify where you see someone else, even a partner, has simply been an object for you to exploit and utilize for your own so-called pleasure. Uh, observing this principle also means that families would more likely remain intact. And that has a huge effect on the protection of children children growing up in, in two-parent households. Um, it, it's just shown all over the world. They end up often, not always, but often doing, doing better in life. And of course, it deals with, you know, modesty and, and principles like that. So then the sixth item was to be pure in mind and hygienic in body. Seventh was not to be inimical towards anyone. And of course, that's huge. Uh, I mean, okay, what about if they deserve it? No, not to be inimical towards anyone. To be simple and to support um, subordinates or even servants. So I've just gone over a whole slew, a broad range of different types of, of virtues that we could consider um, seeking to acquire. And what I'd like to do next week is to focus on a list of things that were, it's not the whole thing, but um, a list of virtues or qualities that were considered important that anyone who is seeking to live a better life, to try and become a better person, to become peaceful, to taste happiness in this lifetime, that it is absolutely essential that from these items that we'll talk about, that you actually build some sort of list, a code by which you over time, become very committed to, to living by. If we want to, the, the world to become a better place, we don't have the power to make that happen. But we do have the power to become a better person. And by doing that, then we will have the... Um, we will have an effect on those 
particularly our own family members and children. Um, we will become examples and we will demonstrate in our by our own life how it is possible to live as a better person in a very humble condition to live as a better person. So um, that's it. We'll get into some uh, detail on, on some of these things or a suggested list that you may consider. But I really, you know, give you a little one week challenge here. How about really thinking about building some sort of list yourself of things that you think you could adopt or should adopt in order to begin, even if it's just a beginning, to live a better life. Thank you very, very much. So, of course, the we know that the thing that's really going to make a difference uh, in helping people come to experience these internal changes and to make it easier. It's going to be through this pro a process of meditation. So we will chant these transcendental sounds, these mantras. And in doing so, our hearts and minds become purified. We can see with more clarity, we are less pulled by just the mind and the passions, we can be a little bit dispassionate and step back a little bit and look at things and consider what is the appropriate way forward for us in this lifetime. So we will chant the mantra, um, Haribol Nitai Gor, Nitai Gor Haribol. Haribo nitai go, nitai go haribo. Haribo nitai go, nitai go haribo. Haribo nitai go, nitai go haribo. Haribo nitai go. Nitai go, Hari bo, Hari bo, Nitai go, Nitai go, Hari bo, Hari bo, Nitai go, Nitai go, Hari bo, Hari bo, Nitai go.
thank you very much once again.